the time, the summer of the year 1650, the place, England. One Sunday morning in the city of Derby, in the English Midlands, in this church, an important event took place. The Puritan Revolution was over, the bloody civil war had ended, King Charles I had been beheaded and Oliver Cromwell proclaimed protector of the English Commonwealth. Now the people yearned to settle down into some form of normalcy under the new government and the new dominant religion. This church had only recently been changed from an Anglican one into a Puritan one. This had been achieved by Cromwell's troops by smashing all the statuary, all the stained glass windows, by picking up the altar and all the popish trappings and throwing them out into the street. So now the church was ready for, well, some form of consecration. Uh, that morning, the sermon was given by a certain Colonel Barton, who was not only a lay preacher, but also a member of Parliament. It was rumored that he was a confidant of Oliver Cromwell's. So the entire establishment of the city of Derby was present. Uh, there was the mayor, there were the aldermen, uh, there was the judiciary, and uh, <clears throat> the lesson that morning was read by old Judge Gervais Bennett, who uh, <clears throat> was a personal friend of uh, Colonel Barton's and also a member of Parliament. The body of the church was crammed full of officers and soldiers of the colonel's regiment for, boy, if your colonel gives a sermon, you'd better be there. In parade uniform, spick and span, looking religious under the roving eye of your sergeant major. So there they sat, row upon row in red and white, staring stolidly ahead and woe betide the private who dared to nod off. Must have been tough. Sermons in those days lasted anything up to three hours and frequently ran over. And most of them must have fought a losing battle with sleep when, thank God, suddenly in the back of the church, a man jumped to his feet, a vagabond who cried, Come, friend! Christ says this, Paul says that, but what canst thou say? After a moment of baffled surprise among the congregation, the man's feet must have left the ground. At least a dozen soldiers must have thrown themselves upon him, swept him off his feet, and carried him out of the church where they threw him down the steps. And as many officers and soldiers as could get decently away with it must have escorted him to prison. For a religious fanatic to interrupt the church service uh, was not exceptional in those heady days of newfound religious freedom. Small Protestant sects were swarming all over England. New ones were springing up every day with names like the Sabbatarians, the Anti-Sabbatarians, the Muggletonians, the Seekers, the Ranters. Uh, they usually were the personal congregations of one charismatic evangelist or preacher, and all of them interrupted church services, but to have interrupted this particular service well. To do that, you must have been a real nut who had lost all contact with reality. 
the name of the young man who was now being dragged off to prison was George Fox. He was 26 years old, a shepherd from the fens of Leicestershire, and there among his sheep he had received a revelation. He had heard a voice telling him that if God had ever spoken to the individual, direct, as he did in the Old Testament, then he was still doing so today to anyone who was prepared to listen to the still, small voice in his own heart. God did not speak to congregations. He spoke to people. And anyone who imposed himself between that individual and his God, calling himself an intermediary, had to be removed. So, no more priests, no more parsons, no more churches, no more set prayers, liturgy, hymns, creeds intoned in unison. No, no, no. The experience of the presence of God, of the presence. And that experience brought about love for the neighbor, for the other unique, irreplaceable individual. So, no more titles, no more differences in rank, no, 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 no. Everybody should be addressed by his first name, addressed with thee and thou. You must go for that of God in the other and embrace him with love. Well, George Fox had preached his revolutionary gospel of love for a number of months, when here in the church in Derby that Sunday morning, his luck ran out. For when his case came to trial in the old town hall in Derby, there were two judges. One was uh, Gervais Bennett, who had read the lesson that morning. And the other was Colonel Barton himself. Judge Gervais Bennett presided. From her prison cell in Lancaster Castle, Margaret wrote letters to Charles II here in Hampton Court. Uh, she wrote letters pleading for the freedom of other Quakers, not her own. And she started her letters, like she started all her letters, with the words, Dear Heart. That intrigued Charles, who was an urbane, witty, somewhat jaded man. We remember him uh, from his extravagant hats, the high fashion, and maybe because he was called the Merry Monarch and was reputed to have 14 illegitimate children. In any case, he had a young mistress called Nell Gwynne, an actress who gaily called him Charles III because she had already had two lovers called Charles. Charles was intrigued by these tender notes from this uh, presumably young woman in a prison in the north of England. And so he said, um, I'd like to see her. Someone said, but your majesty, she's a Quaker. So I've been told, have her come down. And so it happened. Margaret was released from prison. She traveled down to London. She was presented at court. And when Charles saw the gaunt, 
white-haired old woman with her lined face and her fierce blue eyes. Uh, she was not quite what he had imagined, so after a rather meaningless short audience, she departed, but she did not return to prison. She returned to Swarthmore Hall. The fact that Charles had been unimpressed by the fact that she was a Quaker can be explained by the circumstance that he had a Quaker at court. A young, roly-poly, engaging young man, a bit of an English eccentric, called William Penn. He was the son of the crusty old Admiral Penn, whom uh, Pepys in his famous journal calls a rapacious old rogue. Admiral Penn had lent uh, 16,000 pounds to His Majesty, which may have helped to give Charles II a more lenient attitude toward this boy at court. Also, uh, William was a personal friend of the Duke of York, later King James II. In other words, he was well protected and he needed this protection. Because he was an extravagant young man. He had become a Quaker of sorts <coughs> while a student in Oxford at an age when life is fascinating. Every single facet of it is absolutely captivating. And so there was George Fox and he preached and he preached about equality of all men, the inward experience of God, thee and thou to everybody, never take off your hat and, oh, this was fascinating. And so here he was at court, a Quaker, and uh, not to take off your hat to dignitaries and magistrates, it wasn't all that exciting, really. No. <laughs> the real challenge would be to refuse to take off your hat to the king. Uh, that morning, uh, His Majesty, as usual, walked around the pond to feed the geese, uh, carrying his little dog, Nell Gwynn, behind him, and some of the members of his court. And wherever he went, everybody bent down low, took off their hats and swept them, and made a leg. However, among them was this delighted fat boy his sturdy legs well spread, his hat firmly on his head. At first, it seemed as if His Majesty didn't notice, uh, but then he came toward him and looked him up and down, and everybody thought, there goes the boy's head. But no. Suddenly the king took off his own hat. And William asked, why dost thou do that, Charles? And the king replied, I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Penn, it is customary in this place that in the presence of the monarch, only one person shall wear a hat. There has been some speculation why Charles II allowed Will Penn to get away with that prank. For amusing as the incident may have been, it was les majesty. Many Quakers were languishing in prison for the same act of defiance involving dignitaries of a much lesser stature. 
it is generally assumed that it was because of the debt the king had of 16,000 pounds with the old admiral or because he had an innate sense of humor but I believe there is another explanation. Will Penn, even at that age, must have had about him the unmistakable aura of greatness for those who could see. And I think that the incident of the hat relates a moment a moment of encounter between two men of genius with almost a shock of recognition. Anyhow, when the old admiral heard about it, he gave a vent to a burst of language that must have been extremely salty. He decided that enough was enough. Any sane person could see that this idiot boy was bound to end up in the tower. So he sent him out of harm's way to Ireland, so-called to manage the family estates. A genteel exile that lasted a number of years. The dream that George Fox first saw on Pendle Hill, the dream of the great people to be gathered, the ideal community with freedom for all, freedom of conscience for every individual, freedom of religion, no difference between races, peoples, sexes, and there would be a city called the city of brotherly love. Well, that was too long. You couldn't call a city a city of brotherly love in Latin. Um, Philadelphia. This concept that was first realized in Philadelphia, is now realized all over America. Sarasota, Florida, Newtown, Pennsylvania, Barnesville, Ohio, Sheridan, Wyoming, Big Timber, Montana, they're all built on that same pattern that was first dreamt up by this joyous, playful genius lying in his bed, gazing at the ceiling, seeing the vision, the glory, that land, that great land, that holy experiment. The map of the center of Philadelphia was the first reality that resulted from the vision and the vision expanded. Everything came in great rushes of inspiration. The whole organization of the state, the charter of privileges, the freedom. But where? Where could William and his Quakers start that peaceable kingdom, that holy experiment? In reality, the world was theirs, but practically only the American colonies were suitable. Now, it so happened that in the American colonies, Quakers were severely persecuted everywhere. In Massachusetts, four of them had been hanged in Boston. Captains who entered the harbor of Boston and brought Quakers ashore were heavily fined and risked to have their ships confiscated. In the Carolinas, 
They were as severely persecuted. There was no place in the American colonies where friends could settle in virgin wilderness, except, except in the territory that had been conquered in 1664 and taken from the Dutch. Now, it so happened that the old admiral, William Penn's father, had lent the king, oh, years ago, the sum of 16,000 pounds sterling. Of course, the king had never paid this back because to lend the crown money was a privilege. However, when the old admiral died, William inherited that debt and that gave him the idea to ask King Charles for a piece of that virgin wilderness west of the Delaware. Oh yes, yes, the king thought it was an excellent idea, excellent. And no wonder, because the territory was considered to be totally worthless. Uh, to make it sound a little more elegant, uh, <clears throat> He even suggested a name. Uh, why not, by royal charter, call that new territory after the dear old admiral? Hmm? Say Penn's Woods. Penn Sylvania. As soon as the colony of Pennsylvania had become a reality, William Penn crossed into fog-bound, chilly Holland to solicit colonists for the holy experiment. He went to Holland because his mother was Dutch, he spoke the language fluently. There were many Quakers at that time. He went from farmhouse to farmhouse, from meeting to meeting, and handed out pamphlets describing the new colony of Pennsylvania. Of course, all those who wanted to join him had to be Quakers, but he was very careful to select artisans, people who would be useful in the founding of a new society in the wilderness. Because the example of the lost colony of Virginia was still fresh in their minds and he was determined that that would not happen to them. And so it came about that one day in the fall of 1682, the good ship Welcome lay at anchor on the Thames near the tower, ready to sail, with on board 100 Quakers and their families. Before they wound anchor to leave, they unrolled a banner saying, Now let us try. King Charles, who was pleasuring on the Thames in the royal barge, heard about this, well, this he had to see. So, as the ship was preparing to leave, there came the royal barge, with on board King Charles with his plumed hat in his most elegant outing costume, by his side, Nell Gwyn in white silk, like a large white rose. Uh, uh, the story goes uh, that uh, His Majesty, uh, looking up uh, from the gilded box of the royal barge, gazed at all those somber black hats and that uh, somewhat baroque uh, banner, and that he singled out William Penn high above and called, well, Mr. Penn, uh, 
You'd better be careful, or you'll end up in the Indian's cooking pot. <laughs> I don't think so, William Penn answered, because I think I'll have no problems with the Indians. We will go for that of God in them. Uh, I, I beg your pardon? We will pay for the land we intend to use. But, my dear man, it is already yours. You bought it from me, remember? Yes, William said, and pretty dear too. It is said that after the vessel had vanished from sight, and the royal barge had turned around, heading back to Hampton Court, his majesty said to no one or nobody in particular, I wonder if it runs in the family, you know. If you ask me, the old admiral was slightly touched in the head too. King Charles must have smiled as he watched the empty Thames and the greyness on the horizon because he took a perverse pleasure in presenting himself as a somewhat inane fop. But he was quite the reverse. He was the first who had recognized the genius of William Penn and its consequences. Because south of what was now Pennsylvania was Maryland, which belonged to a medieval sort of character, Lord Baltimore, uh, a rather infantile person, very cantankerous, and uh, it worried, or it had worried, Charles to have those two as neighbors, for imagine that over a bottle of claret, uh, they would get together and become fast friends and say, why should we pay taxes and duties to the crown? What can he do if we were to refuse to pay? Well, <laughs> He could do something, and he had. The two gentlemen each had a map of their territory, uh, but it was only later, when they were already there, that they realized that their two territories overlapped ever so slightly. Uh, there was one area, a very thin, narrow border strip, uh, that... Uh, was contested territory. And that was exactly what Baltimore wanted. That's what he had waited for. He wanted jousting, chivalry, a medieval war. And so he moved into what William Penn considered to be Pennsylvania. And Charles had been so astute. In his judgment of William Penn's character, he had foreseen that the flame of youth, the vision of the peaceable kingdom, would eventually succumb to what was called maturity. For as a man, as a carnal person, William Penn was a skinflint. And so it happened that as far as he was concerned, personally, the holy experiment ended in the sad quicksands of a row between the neighbors. And the king thereby postponed the American Revolution by a century. And when Congress finally decided that the two states should have a clear borderline, uh, they uh, 
gave the assignment to two professional land surveyors to determine the exact center line of that area. And the names of the surveyors were Mason and Dixon. And so, 200 years after Charles's slyness, there was the blood-drenched border between the North and the South in the war between the states. So, as quickly as possible, they rowed upriver in boats. And here is where they landed. In the first letter's home, this spot is described as paradise. A virgin wilderness, innocent country unspotted by the world. The image is touching in its innocence. There is William Penn holding the Indian's hand. They look like two children in kindergarten in the playground. It is this innocence which has seduced us to regard the occasion of one of total benevolence. It was a little more complicated than that. There were two kinds of Indians present at that first meeting. There were the Delawares, who were agricultural Indians, living in villages, farmers, who were ready to give him the benefit of the doubt. They had been prepared by Quakers who lived way across the Delaware in New Jersey, the first settlers there, who had brought across that letter which he had written to the noble savage. However, in the background there were other Indians. There was a taciturn chief sitting in that circle who did not share in the general benevolence, and in the background were young braves bows and arrows at the ready, looking at the scene with cynicism. They were the ones, the hunters, the trappers, who had had contact with other white men, namely the early settlers along the Delaware, the Swedes, the Dutch, the English, who all called one another bandits. And I'm afraid that all of them were right. It was common practice uh, to order a certain amount of furs from a certain Indian clan. And then when they were on their way back through the forest with their harvest, they would be intercepted, uh, given rum. And when they were senseless with drink, their furs would be stolen. And if there was one who protested, he was shot. So the only reality these Indians knew and recognized was the fact that the muskets of the settlers carried further than the Indian arrows. It was these that William Penn had been warned about by his scouts. Something would have to be done. Somehow they would have to convince these Indians of their goodwill, their peaceable intent. But how? After going into meeting, after discussing it among themselves, after prayer, after opening themselves to the presence, 
they came to the conclusion that here was the challenge. They had arrived with that banner, now let us try what love will do. Now they had to put it into practice. It was not that they should bring the Indians to trust them. They should trust the Indians and move in among them unarmed with their families and be totally at their mercy. It was the only way of approaching that of God in those Indians. It was difficult to find a way of doing this because the scouts had warned don't make the first move. Let them do it. But how? All they could do, they decided after a few days, was wait for a miracle. Unpack their implements from the boats and hope and pray. As they were lining up on the shore, their plows and their axes and their spades and their mouse-proof barrels of grain, Indians would come strolling by and look at all these alien instruments and one of them would sit down and watch them for a while and then ask one of them, are you by any chance uh, looking for a place where to grow things? And the young Quaker would say, oh, oh yes, yes, why? Does thee know of such a place? I'll, I'll pay for it. I have money. Oh, yes, uh, the Indian would say, I know of such a place. And there it was, the miracle, the voice of God. Uh, where, friend, where? Oh, a little ways into the forest. Far? How far? Oh, two, three days. And what's it like, friend? What's it like? Tell me. And um, <clears throat> then the Indian would describe in glowing terms a land flowing with milk and honey. And then the young Quaker would say, can I take my implements with me? Oh, yes, the Indian would say, sure, yes, I'll, I'll get you a couple of oxen. And, and my young family, my wife, my children, can I take them? Yes, the Indian would say, of course, let's take them. And then on the eighth day, miles away from anywhere in the heart of the virgin forest, the Indian would say, well, here it is. What do you think of it? And the young Quaker farmer would say, well, there's an awful lot of trees. He said, oh yes, you, you would have to take those down, but there is, look, there is a brook down there, and there there is a lovely dell, and you'll see it's perfect, perfect for what you want. So start, start taking, taking down the trees, but you must ask permission first. Permission? Whose? The, the trees. You should tell the tree what you're planning to do and why you're taking it down and what you're planning to do with the land and how the tree can serve. And that sounded very pagan and alien to the young farmer and when he hesitated the Indian would say, but look, the tree is a living being like ourselves. We share the same earth. This is his forest. You must ask permission. You must. And then the young Quaker farmer would say, do, do, do I turn toward him? He said, no, no, that's not necessary. A tree hasn't got 
eyes or ears. You just lean against them like this. Yeah, go ahead. Now, now speak. And that was an important moment in the history of the Society of Friends. The young farmer must have overcome an awful resistance. But then he may have remembered that St. Francis had spoken about brother ass and sister flower. So why not brother tree? It was the beginning of the realization of the unity of all life that was to become one of the basic tenets of the Quaker persuasion. And so, almost like a prayer, the young farmer would say, Tree, I, I am, I'm sorry, I, I'll have to take thee down, but it is to, to grow food for myself and my family and my friends for the peaceable kingdom we are founding in this forest. And so forgive me if I'll topple thee, but I promise thee the, thy logs will build our house and thy branches will feed our fire in winter. And with every piece of wood we put on the fire, we'll think of thee and thank thee. And then the Indian would say, now give him a kiss. Is it a kiss? Yes. Give him a kiss. Express your love. And then the young farmer would turn around and And then, when the trees had been felled, and the roots dug up and burnt, and the weeds already began to grow on the new land, the Indian who had sold it, so-called, came and asked the Quaker farmer, what are you going to grow here? Oh, the farmer said, uh, corn. That's good, the Indian said, that's good, that's what it's for. Uh, did, you have, did you have it with you? Yes, the farmer said, look, I brought it all the way from Europe in these mouse-proof barrels, and he opened them, and the grain had come across beautifully. But the Indian looked at it with scorn and said, that's not corn, that's weeds. No, no, the farmer said, this is, this is, this is corn, that's what we bake bread from. Nah, the Indian said, that's not corn. Hey, this is corn. And a squaw came and brought an ear of corn. Oh, but that, that's not corn, the farmer said. That's maize. You can't bake bread of that. That's for cattle. Ha! Ah, the Indian said, that's not for cattle. That's for bread. I'll show you. And he called and a squaw brought a loaf of cornbread, and it tasted delicious. That's what we grow here, the Indian said. You ask the land, get down on your knees, ask the land. Well, the Quaker farmer was prepared to believe it without that. And then the Indian asked, do you know how to grow it? Mm, not really. We never grew this at home. And then the Indian's eyes lit up and he said, Ah, in that case, I have just the man for you. For an occasional problem among the nomadic tribes of the Indians were old men. Old women were no problem. If they no longer had someone to look after them, they were just abandoned in the forest. There was a little plaintive wailing for a while. 
and then silenced. Old men, of course, was different. They were given a solemn farewell, a feast, after which they were supposed, and most of them did, to vanish into the forest, never to return. There were, however, the occasional old tough character who liked the party but did not like the walking into the forest. And so he came back. Like some old actors, he had one farewell tour after another, and they were a problem. What to do with them? You could not leave them behind like the women. And here, ha, there was the answer at least for one of them, and maybe more. Leave them with those touched in the head. And so the cantankerous old dotard stayed behind with the young Quaker family as the tribe moved on. And the young Quaker farmer asked, now how do I sow this? And the old man said, well, like this. And he took a handful and threw it among the weeds. But the young Quaker said, that, 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 that won't grow. Oh, yes, the Indian said, some of them will grow, some will not. That's the way life is. And then at last, the patient young friend set his jaw and said, not in Krefeld, it isn't. I'm going to plow. Huh? I'm going to plow. And he hitched the oxen, those patient pioneers of civilization, to his plow and started in straight lines to plow the land. And the old Indian was aghast. He was tearing up the soil. You must ask permission. And so the young farmer said, thee ask permission. I'll do the plowing. And so it happened. And then when the plowing was done, the young farmer and his wife each walked down the field one furrow at a time, and with a pointed stick made holes at equal distances, while alongside them the old Indian danced and chanted incantations in contact with the spirit of the earth. And then later, in each of those little holes, one seed was dropped. And then, months later, months of warm sunshine and gentle rain, there it was. And the young farmer called the old Indian and said, look, look, it's ready for harvest, look. But the old Indian said, ah, no, 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 not yet, not yet. But it, it never grows any higher in Krefeld. Ah, said the old Indian, but I asked the earth to make it grow higher. And when finally the corn was ready to be harvested, there was so much of it that even after half of it had been bartered with the Indians for pelts, there still was far too much to load onto that one ox wagon and take to Philadelphia. And they so wanted to go to Philadelphia. The young farmer wanted to show this bountiful harvest to his friends, hoping others would join them. And the young farmer's wife, well, it was maybe an unquakerly thought, but she would so love to talk to some other woman than a squaw. But what to do with the children? They could not take those toddlers again eight days through the forest. That was too much of a hardship for them. And then they hit upon the idea to ask the Indians to take care of them. And that's what happened. So they went to Philadelphia 
and left their children with the Indians. And that was the beginning. From that moment, a generation of Quakers grew up to whom the world of the Indian was as familiar as the world their parents had brought across the ocean. Woods Indians were joined by Woods Quaker.